Hi, this is Libby. And this is Roberta. And this is Art Blog Radio. Today we're speaking with Annette Monnier. Annette has been involved in some of the most groundbreaking gallery collectives in Philadelphia. She's an artist, a writer, and the outreach coordinator at the Clay Studio, where she manages the Claymobile programs. Annette is a blogger, and since 2009, she's been reviewing one exhibit a month and writing an in-depth think piece about it. Annette is from Cincinnati and graduated in 2003 with a BFA in sculpture from the Art Academy of Cincinnati. She's very interested in community, and when she moved to Philadelphia with some friends, she was part of a member cooperative gallery, Black Floor. Later, that gallery morphed into Copy Gallery, and both of those venues made a large mark on the Philly art scene. That interest in community shows up in her ambitiously scaled ink drawings that chronicle her life, her friends, and in one case, her vision of City Hall with young people and animals taking over. We should say that Annette used to write for Art Blog and that she worked for us as sponsorship coordinator several years ago. So you've also been curating, and um, I'm wondering, do you see any connection between the art and the writing and the curating? I think it's all the same thing. I mean, to me, it's all art. To me, my work with the Clay Studio is art. My reviewing is art. Whether I'm actually making an object, which I actually do a lot less now than the other things. But I see it's all the same thing. And I think my drawings, for instance, were always really interested in this idea of community and people and things happening together, whether those were good things or bad things. And that's really the same thing my writing is about, that same kind of dialogue. And in a way, I think like the writing is kind of a more immediate, direct way to install that than the drawing was. Well, how is the writing about community? Well, most of my writing is focused on shows in Philadelphia um, or New York, but usually when there's going to be a show reviewed in New York, it's all about the dialogue here in Philadelphia. It's about expanding that dialogue. It's about getting other people involved with that dialogue. And I think pretty much everybody thinks that there's not enough journalism covering that. And so to me, there was a void, which you guys are helping to fill, but I felt like I could help to fill as well and that I was interested in. And that also I'm just kind of interested in keeping this record. I don't want these shows to be forgotten. I think they're important. One of the uh, things, one of the many things in your um, career so far has been involved with being involved with other people and being involved in galleries that are group efforts. So could you talk about that a little? You're mostly talking about the time with Black Floor and then Copy Gallery. Yes. Um, I feel like when I we started Black Floor Gallery, um, the bunch of us, which I'll just name, Nick Paparum, Jamie Dillon, Carrie Collins, Garrick Forston, and Elsa Sh uh, Shadley, um, we had really just moved to Philadelphia. So really starting Black Floor was our first sort of like meeting the community. Did you all come from the same place? We all came from Ohio, um, various parts of Ohio. Well, Garrett came from Kentucky and then to Ohio. But yes, basically all from Ohio. And a lot of us had actually gone to the same school, the Art Academy of Cincinnati, but we didn't all go to school together. Um, I remember Jamie saying something, quoting Field of Dreams at that time, if you build it, they will come. I mean, which is all kind of very <laughs> silly, but that's sort of how it <laughs> happened. The gallery had a great feel to it. I've had people tell me that the, the name was great. It was a third floor walk up, so it felt very sort of mysterious. And then you would come up there and there'd be like a realistic, pretty great art show going on, which you didn't expect. I think that's when I realized people were really able, for no money at all, I mean, we basically were using our own money to do this. And the artists that we asked to show did some amazing things at that gallery with absolutely no compensation. And that's when I realized that people were just really willing to give a lot of themselves to show for really no reason other than to do it because they thought it was a worthwhile thing to do. The only thing we could give them as a gallery was not money, but an audience. And that's when like the development of an audience, the getting the people there, the talking to the people, the community building became really important. It's very hard to sustain that momentum and you didn't have any money, it was all coming out of your pockets to do these exhibits and rent the space and all of that. And so at a certain point, you had something happened and it changed into something else. So can you explain a little, just tell us the history of what happened. Well, it's, I guess, 
When we started the gallery, the space was basically this deserted old sewing factory. It was really disgusting. The space really didn't improve in disgustingness except for maybe the gallery area and the time that we lived there. It wasn't a great place to live. Did and there, you live there? We lived there for, I think, all of Black Floor's existence. When Copy came in, we had moved out and we made it artist studios, but, um, and Copy was a lot smaller than Black Floor, which allowed for that to happen. And it was always a construction site. Something was always being built. The gallery was always in flux. Something was always happening on a monthly basis. We were all very young. But I think eventually you want more than one shower for six people, and that kind of stuff sorts, starts to wear on you. Some people may be making more money than some people, so some people want a different living situation. And you're giving a lot of money to the gallery, which can be pretty taxing. And I think kind of what happened with Black Floor is we were invited by the ICA to do the locally localized gallery show, and that just seemed like the perfect ending. Everybody was kind of done. But for me, the opening of Copy was sort of like, I miss it so much and it's not even over yet, let's have another gallery. But not everybody was interested in doing that. <laughs> so with less people and an addition of Dave Dunn and Lauren Jennison, we then opened up a different space in the same space with a different name. <laughs> and a smaller space, I want to say. Wasn't yes, it? <laughs> it was smaller on purpose because we thought it would be less work. Black Floor was developed to be an ambitious space made for sculpture where someone could really take over the space and transform it and do something highly, highly ambitious, which is what we were really into at the time and what we really wanted someone to ask us to do as artists. Just take over and make it amazing. That was sort of our gift to artists that we were developing this space where they could do that. Copy was more like, gee, it's exhausting to do that kind of show with like a smaller space where it's easier to make an impact. <laughs> um, so that was sort of our gift to artists was you can do something and it won't take that much work to transform this space. It's like a little space. And is there a favorite show that you had from Copy Gallery? Definitely. It's split and they were both shows that Ben Peterson designed, but he made a tiki bar in the gallery. What I really liked about it was when people came in that night, they were like, what is this place? And they could buy the tiki drinks, and people started playing limbo. And it was just kind of an open space where anything could happen. Of course, there was alcohol involved. And it was just a really fun night. And I think by that time back, Fox Popula was next door, which was this really great environment of having this legit gallery and then having this, what the hell is this? Which I really, really liked. The other one he did was... All he did was put three milk crates stacked up in like bungee cords like sticking together so it wasn't really stable in the middle of the gallery. And then he just had beer. <laughs> this is all beer involved too. There's but. a theme here. <laughs> but <laughs> the idea was you were supposed to drink the beer and then use it as a device to build something on top of this pedestal, which was this rickety bunch of milk crates. And that actually totally disintegrated into fights and people throwing things at each other and was in a way really, really horrible, but really cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, what was cool about it? My relationship with community, and I think from my drawings kind of shows this, is kind of, I love a group of people. I love what can happen in a group of people, but I think what can happen in a group of people isn't always good. Taken into the fact also that this was happening in an art gallery, with a potentially really legit gallery next door, Vox Populi, so you have that. In a way, with the art gallery, you're saying, be on your best behavior, don't react in certain ways. And then when you can do something with an audience that's actually planning on coming to an art gallery that then disintegrates into this crazy madness, I like how unexpected and, I don't know, I just love that. <laughs> well, it's more like a, a happening from the 60s almost. Yeah, I mean, different, which but probably... Because it's unplanned. Maybe not as serious. <laughs> no political agenda, really. Speaking of politics, yeah. could you talk a little bit about politics in your work? We were remembering that you had this American flag hanging in Padlock Gallery at one point, mm -hmm. and it was black and white, as I recall. Huge. On a mm -hmm. sheet, I think. If I'm recalling right, that was a pretty politically charged climate. The Bush administration was almost at the end. Barack Obama was maybe running for president right around that time. It was kind of my personal relationship to America by drawing it, drawing it huge. 
making it black and white was definitely sort of an anarchist statement, maybe like removing the color, saying like I'm kind of confused about my relationship with America, but certainly I like America. I'm drawing the flag really huge. It's confusing. I mean, really, I'm not going to be able to say anything more than it was about my confused relationship with my own country and the political problems happening around that time. Also about liking something for form only, like for instance, I believe it was Spider-Man 1 or something which ended with that great um, him swinging in front of the American flag really big, which I remember some people like love the movie, hate that last scene with the blast to America, but I kind of loved that last scene. So all that was sort of like in there, like form and how great the form is and how this beautiful set of stars and stripes inspires a lot of feelings and a lot of people regardless of, and that could be any flag, that could be the French flag and array of color and stripes inspiring people to like great emotion and great emotional heights and how that can happen really easily. There's another piece that you drew that also seemed political to us and <clears throat> it was a trompe l'oeil rendering of a New York Times article that was about abortion. So can you talk a little bit about why you would make this drawing that was actually word for word a complete trompe l'oeil drawing of this article? Right. Well, that show in particular, I kind of, um, it was part of a show where I felt like the entire show was pretty much decorative and pretty and kind of shallow. And then I remember opening up the paper and seeing that article. And I remember being like, okay, why am I making this decorative pretty artwork when there's like things that I really care about happening in the world that I'm not doing anything about? What does my artwork mean? Why am I doing this? Why am I, at that time I made a drawing that was all stickers. <laughs> like I bought tons of stickers from Chinatowns and I just made this thing it was all about just plastic and shallow, wasteful to the environment, like glorifying these like plastic polymers that are horrible for everybody. And I still really like them and stickers and stuff like that, but it's just sort of that guilt of making art that might be aesthetically pleasing, but you know, all this other stuff is happening in the world, so does it matter that you're making something that's aesthetically pleasing? So let's talk about funny and talk about humor because your art does have a thread of humor in it and you are, you like to laugh and you're a, a funny person and yet you're writing. <laughs> <laughs> if I have to think of it, it's, it's quite serious, you're writing. I'm not a very good funny person. Like if there are jokes in the, the work, it's like, I don't expect people to get it, and it's not probably that funny to other people. I'm really kind of a nerd, but I think I do have a sense of humor. I appreciate funny in other people. I don't like a lot of writing about art. That's one of the reasons I do it. I just think a lot of it's kind of pompous and silly and over the top, and occasionally I'll find a thread of something that I like and won't like the rest of it. But I do think you should know about the things that you're going to say you don't like. So do you ever think of going to get an MFA for yourself, or what do you think? Um, not an MFA, certainly. Um, if I went back to school, it would probably be for something like um, cultural arts management, or a business degree, or um, possibly art history. Um, but I don't think I will. I like working, and I like gaining experience through working. And I think work experience should be valued more than it is. I love my job working for the Claymobile, and I do put in more than 40 hours a week usually doing it, which certainly cuts back on my own personal activities that I could be doing. But I think maybe mentioning that drawing, which I actually haven't thought about for years, the whole, and abortion's maybe the wrong th thing to talk about, but that sort of like guilt when I was doing a private studio practice most of the time, I don't have that anymore, and I feel really, really good. We've been talking with Annette Monnier. Annette, thanks so much. No problem. Art Blog Radio is brought to you by theartblog.org. Thanks to our sponsors, including the Knight Foundation. Also, we want to thank Peter Crimmins, who makes us sound good. He's our editor. And thanks to Eric Biondo for his music. You can download these podcasts at theartblog.org slash radio.